an original MCM production. Welcome, good Halloween Eve, to Boswell Book Company. As you can tell, I'm festive for the days ahead. Today is day 3,133 since we have opened. And tonight we are very welcome to, a, oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, today we are very welcome to, and excited to welcome Julie Lee Kohler Houseman. Um, but tonight before we get started, um, I'd like to remind you of a few other upcoming programs that you might be interested in. Uh, Friday, November 3rd at 7 p.m. we will be hosting a Murder and Mayhem preview with Stephen Mac Jones and Danny Gardner. Um, these are two mystery authors who are also invi uh, involved in the Murder and Mayhem panel the next day on the 4th. Um, then we also have, as a part of the Ziedler Memorial Lecture, Heather Ann Thompson, author of Blood in the Water, The Attica Prison Uprising of 1971 and its Legacy, will be at Turner Hall on Monday, November 6th at 7. And then last but not least, we have David Christinger, author of See Me for Who I Am, Student Veterans, War Stories, and Coming Home. Um, he will be joining us Tuesday, November 7th at 7 p.m. And before I introduce our author, I would like to wearing up uh, her mother, Julie Lee Kohler. And she is going to uh, say a few words. <laughs> just, in, just in case you don't see that I am really excited and happy <laughs> and proud and wondering where she came from. <laughs> that's her father and that's where she came from. Everybody, thank you so much for coming. This is just wonderful. I'm so proud of Julia. What she did, write a book? I can't even write a thank you note. <laughs> I'm really terrible. I don't know how she did it. It's so hard. But she did, and we're here, and I thank you for coming and being observers of this. <coughs> and the thing that let me do that is that I belong to the Milwaukee Turners, and I see some wonderful members of the Milwaukee Turners here that have believed in, in the importance of civil discourse and importance of action, civic action, for 150 years. And we're trying to carry on that, that and we're doing that with, I've got Ames McGinnis here, we've got, we've got also it's Arthur Hartzer, our, our president, and this is about we're having three different things on ma in confronting mass incarceration. And last time it was, um, last Thursday, it was um, uh, college in prison from the Bard Prison Initiative. And then Julia, who's talking about the history of, of how this happens. How this happens, how are we where we are today? How did it happen? We're all a part of it. And we need to know more and understand more about it. And that's what she, writes about. And then next week, we have Heather Thompson, Heather Ann Thompson, who wrote, a, who took 14 years to write about Blood in the Water. And it's because it was all hidden. It took her 14 years to dig out the truth. So that's Milwaukee Turners, and thank you, Boswell Books. And back to you, Boswell Books. <laughs> all right, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so we're very excited. I'll give you a quick bio. Uh, Julie Lee Kohler Hausman is the Assistant Professor of History at Cornell University. She specializes in US political and social history. Her research explores the ways politics and policy uh, intersect with gender, race, and class. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to our author. It's so lovely to be here. <laughs> um, I am so honored to be part of this really important conversation about mass incarceration in Wisconsin and about how, how we sort of think about and maybe intervene in this, in, in this issue. 
I want to thank Turner's and for the organizers that are sort of that have done the hard work to pull this conversation together. We just came from a panel earlier, today, like a couple hours ago. So if I'm a little fried, it's um, that I'll, I'll give some of that credit. Um, I want to thank Julie Kohler, which I guess now you've already sauced out um, <laughs> that there's some <laughs> conspiracies. Um, you know, she, she's really been an incredible driver of these, you know, and done and, and of this and an engine of so many other um, things. And so, and so, thanks for pushing me to do this. Um, and thank you all for coming. This has to be my craziest like audience ever to talk. Um, so, my, my, there's people who are genuinely like probably Boswell. Like, oh, no problem. Um, I'm a college professor. That's nothing. Like, we're used to, like, <laughs> like um, I, there are people in the audience, there are people in the audience who are just probably, like, come to Boswell events. I have, um, but there's people who work on these issues in this audience. There's family members, aunts, cousins, dear old family friends, um, parents. The one that's kind of freaking me out right now is ex-high school teachers. <laughs> I'm kind of wondering if I'm going to get graded and at what point. Um, I'm like having fun. I'm like, wait, did I, did I get it all? So, um, so really, it's a it's a super honor to have such a um, you know such a different so so many different groups um, of people from my life here. And you know, I'm obviously from Milwaukee, so it means a lot to talk about this work here. Um, I also sort of want to just run for the hills, <laughs> no, but in the sense, of, or, or make like sort of just force us into having a cocktail party instead. But what I'm going to do um, is is actually talk about uh, this this book, about where it came from, um, it's sort of generally, and the argument that I want the book to make. But then I'm going to use because that part feels a little bit abstract to me. So then I want to sort of tell a story. Um, I'm a believer in sort of using stories as ways to describe arguments, and um, and I want to tell one story. I'm going to tell the story of the, the the origin story of the 1973 Rockefeller drug laws, and many of you have already heard of these laws, but these were um, these like kind of the harshest drug laws in the nation when they were passed, and they're sort of commonly popularly understood as the opening salvo in the modern war on drugs. So people sort of think of this as, I mean, so it, so there's really this um, they're given a lot of weight. It's actually in sort of setting paths forward um, for what we see uh, in, in future years and decades. So Getting Tough, this book, started as an effort to understand. I really want to walk away from this, but will that cause problems? Yeah, it will cause problems? OK, I will not do that. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, the, um, it started as an effort to make sense of mass incarceration, which, you know, sort of the history, the roots of mass incarceration. So how do we get um, to, oh, thank you. Um, how do we get to a moment or today um, where we have the largest penal system, you know, historically, even, even in international comparison? Um, how do we get to that moment from 1970 where there had been 50 years of steady rates of incarceration to the point where his criminologists said that there's just always going to be a certain percentage of the population in prison and it was sort of a steady, it was a steady, um, number, and 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 I was obviously troubled by this phenomenon, like how we have this massive uptick post seventies. What's the sort of cause of this? But I was also curious by what sort of felt to me as a paradox, which is how do we understand? Also, this is a period that is understood popularly as a period of sort of an ascension of rightward politics that is continually described both by its critics and by its supporters as a period of small government <laughs> and a period of state retrenchment as a period of state of state retreat and so for me this felt like I don't understand how we can see this this the, the state in this period the state is in the process at the federal local and na and uh, and and state level of building the most expensive expansive often intrusive, usually intrusive, penal in institutions in US history. And this is happening at a moment where we're characterizing the, the sort of major thrust of politics as being anti-statist or a period of state retreat. So you know, Ronald Reagan is like famously quoted as saying government isn't the solution, it's the problem. You know, Bill Clinton says in 1996, also famously, that you know, we all agree now, I mean, that's not the exact quote, um, the era of big government is over. Um, there, and, and so, this is sort of a widely, ex uh, like widely accepted trope about post-war politics. Um, so what I did is, 
as I guess historians are supposed to do, I went into the archives and I started looking at closely at debates about crime politics and welfare politics um, and drug politics because I wanted to understand not only sort of what was driving the, the, these changes, in and there was a decline in social welfare benefits in the sort of in the um, in the social welfare state for for particular populations during this period. So I went to the archives and I wanted to understand what's the relationship between these trends. Is there a relationship? But there isn't. What's key is there isn't a there isn't like an existing government thing that ties these programs together, right? The tr there's no, you don't spend a dollar on prisons and it doesn't come out of a food stamp budget, right? There's no like direct mechanism. I mean, there's some limits to state, there, you know, there's a, there's a set pie, but not even really for all the way that funding, the funding for these programs happen. So, so what I, um, so what I ended up doing is I've looked at um, three state policies at the state level, because really, to be honest, that's where the major story in prison expansion is actually happening. It's not really a federal story. Um, looked at the state level, three state level politics, one in drug policy, one in welfare policy, and one in criminal sentencing policy. I looked in the 1970s because it's kind of an unequivocally and sort of obviously this place between the 1960s, which is understood as this high water of, of, of American liberalism and of this like big state solutions to social problems, and then Reaganism, which is again understood as this um, era of sort of small government, but also the ascension of conservatism in, in, uh, in US politics. So um, what I ended up arguing in the book, and I kind of don't want to spend too much time on this big stuff because I, I like the stories more, but um, I ended up arguing that, that, there, that there was an, that what happened, that these changes were actually tr triggered by really profound renegotiation of governing strategies for the most marginalized places and spaces in society. That there was this, um, that there had been a series of profound political challenges and economic upheavals in the night that really crested in the 1970s. Um, that, so, um, that opened up space that destabilized the existing understandings of, how, of the right way to respond to these various issues, opened up space, and, and there, there was this really profound struggle over how to interpret and how to respond a series of social, these, these series of social problems. So what we have is a, a slowdown of the long post-war economic boom, a series of profoundly um, uh, pr profound social movements that were challenging the way that, that, um, that the state responded. The, you know, the, the existing welfare state, for instance, there was profound struggles to the sort of limitations within the welfare state, the ways that it hadn't, for instance, historically always, um, typically did not serve African Americans at the same way that it served, um, that it served whites. And so these profound challenges to the liberal welfare state at the same time as this profound economic shifts, um, like opened up, sort of helped produce what people at the time called an urban crisis. And so when you hear the urban crisis, what's amazing about the urban crisis, I'm sure many of you remember the, the, this rhetoric, but what it really does is it throws together a whole host of things that, that actually are sort of different, they're, they're not really all this relate exactly the same, same, same. So there's crime and poverty and drugs and uh, rising welfare costs and, and political insurgency, urban rebellions, and so sort of social movements and economic change. All these things get grouped together under this category of urban crisis. And in, and in, and in these political fights over how to respond to this, these series of problems, the fight was actually not, at least what I found in these, the stories that I looked at, the fight was really never over whether the state had a role in managing these problems. It was not if the state was involved, it was how, it was who the state should hire, who the state should empower to handle these situations, and who, sort of who was the appropriate, um, sort of, who, who were the important, appropriate state agents, or maybe contracted agents, uh, to handle these various problems, and, um, and what strategies were the most, what strategies, like, were the strategies that were uh, actually appropriate? Um, so, so in the book, I actually spent a lot of time excavating these different struggle, these different voices, and these different struggles. And I and I spend a lot of time not just looking at the way that political elites talked about it, but I try to figure out how they, how sort of social movements responded and inter interacted with and interpreted the set of social problems that they were confronting. Um, and 
and I spend a lot of time talking also about people on welfare or people um, in the criminal justice system and the way that they um, and the way that they interpreted the problems that they were dealing with and what they thought the appropriate sort of set of responses would be. So my point is that there was actually quite a lot of openness during there was pe that during this period. Um, and then what I ultimately show in each of the three studies that I follow is that the state, what actually ends up winning in the end is called, is, is basically getting tough, which is a series of, I mean, it's probably, it's relevant enough to all of our political universe that I think you know what I mean by this, but it's the it's strategies of containment, surveillance, um, often retracting be benefits. Like if you do, if you're on welfare, you have to, um, I get to monitor your spending. You know, a series of, um, of, of basically, of strategies that involve creating, creating uh, degraded categories within citizenship, actually, is what it sort of functionally ended up doing. And getting tough was the strategy that won out in each of these stories. But what's fascinating is that in all of the stories, and particularly the Rockefeller story I'll tell today, and I want to emphasize this, it was not at all clear what was going to win out at this, at, at this moment. Or at least a lot of the people that were acting sure didn't know, or they probably would have taken a lot of different steps. Um, so the events that I recount in the book, you know, when, when we sort of take the turn that we all know now is what happens, um, it happened at a moment when the political, the political and programmatic efficacy of gets tough strategies was neither assured nor assumed. So we're talking about a moment when the Republican president was not talking about cutting the number of people on welfare, but was proposing a family assistance plan, as some of you might, you know, might remember, um, proposed a guaranteed minimum income, which would have added 10 million people to the welfare rolls. And this was kind of considered a concern, you know, it actually was, this was not like, Nixon wasn't advocating like a radical um, perspective at that time. Um, the people, I, I shouldn't even laugh, but it's, uh, people talked about very, very seriously that the prison was going to end, that the prison as an instrument in society, because remember there was deinstitution, the people were, um, there was really rapid deinstitutionalization of psychiatric institutions, and there was talk that these institutions were, were going to vanish from, from the public landscape. Um, so, so this was really a fight, and, there, and so what I'm trying to figure out in this book is, why do certain strategies you come to the fore and, and win, and why do, you know, why did others fall away? And there was a lot of different, different visions at this time. So that's my sort of abstract thing, so stick with me. So I um, want to make this less abstract by telling the origin stories of Rockefeller drug laws. And what I want to say is that I want to sort of go through the problems that Nelson Rockefeller faced as he made this proposal, and the ways in which this proposal sort of resolved these problems. Um, and I think you can sort of guess that what I'm, I'm going to suggest that he faced actually what were ultimately political what for, what for, for him, as any politician, felt like they were problems that were political problems for him. And then in a way, the Rockefeller drug laws gave him a political solution, you know, offered him a political way out from a bunch of sort of, ch of challenges that he faced. So. Um, I'm going to talk about the problems that he faced and then talk about how these laws provided this sort of unstable and contested political solution. And I'm particularly interested in the way that these laws help position punishment, okay, because this is what the Rockefeller drug laws are. They're very harsh, punitive laws. Um, they help position punishment as the common sense inevitable response. At a moment, again, when it really what when, when punishment wasn't the inevitable response to drug use. This is the uh, this is the mo this is a period when the idea that drug abuse was a, was a disease was quite ascendant in like I mean especially in um, in elite you know sort of policy circles this was the common understanding the Supreme Court just ruled that you that you actually that you had to consider drug addiction a you know an actual disease um, so so uh, we're, this is also a moment L L Mayor Lindsay of New York City. This is a Republican with national political ambitions, totally a moderate Republican, admittedly. Um, he was publicly floating the idea of methadone, I mean, sorry, not methadone, heroin maintenance clinics in New York City. Like, let's just, like, let's administer heroin in New York City. And there's, I mean, and so this is the, I mean, this is the, these are the kind of conversations that were on the table um, in various ways. So what I'm arguing is that, um, that although the impulse to punish is never absent, I am so not suggesting that this no one like didn't have that impulse, especially when you're confronted with compulsive drug use. But but it was widely discredited in policy circles. So so um, 
And, and what I want to say is that, and this has, I, I wanted to talk about this because it has so many overlaps with the way that people are talking about the opioid situation. Um, but th that what, what the way that this debate played out, which was very much between punishment and treatment, punishment and treatment, really, not only did punishment come to the fore, but it actually served to constrict the range of debate about the problem between punishment and treatment. And sort of, and it really centered the way that people understood drug abuse and drug use and the harms of drug markets as problems of, individu of individuals, right? Neither of those, both of those solutions are the state, are state targeted at, at, ind at individuals. Um, and there was people and many voices at the time who were offering much different frames for the way to understand what was happening and the sort of influx of a lot of, um, of, of, of drug use at this particular moment. Um, so uh, the, the, the debate, and this, is, this I think is quite relevant to the opioid situation, it's frequently in our discourse we talk as if, oh, now we're in a stage where we're punishing or now, we're, now with opioids, we're, we're treating, but before we were punishing. I think, of course, there's something to that. But I want to say that always these debates have been, these, the, who should be punished? Who should be treated? Who should rehabilitation be open to? Who is it not an option for? Meaning that, that e even in this period of the most highly punitive drug laws, there was a massive expansion of drug treatment, of a drug treatment industry, actually, um, that was largely available to middle class folks with insurance, right? So this wasn't, so the drug war period is not just an area of punishment, it's an area where certain populations are punished and certain populations um, have access to treatment. So I think we need to sort of be careful about this like um, binary that is very, um, can, be, can, can be constricting in that it narrows our choices, but also can be constricting in that it doesn't quite capture what's actually going on as far as um, the, the, the debates. So the problems. Obviously, the problems are there's a massive, there is an influx of, um, there's, there's a math, there is a, an undeniably an uptick in um, illicit drug use um, in New York during, after the supply routes reestablished re in World War II. Uh, there, there's, so there is an influx of supply also during the Vietnam War for various reasons. The estimated, now there's actually, the reason I'm pausing is because there's huge debates about the reality, reliability of crime and drug rates, and I don't really want to get into that, but just, it, what matters is that people thought, and, and, and I think there was, a, there was certainly something to these statistics for sure, um, unquestionably people thought that there was massive increases in crime and drugs, um, drug use. And New York City, uh, so there was supposedly a tenfold increase during the 1960s um, to a half, um, so, so there was like supposedly a half million um, heroin addicts in 1970. These, these statistics are so unreliable. But people estimated that half of the drug users lived in New York City. So New York was, New York was the major entry point for, um, the, that was the, the sort of illicit uh, supply, you know, the supply chain. Um, and this, and a lot of that, um, for a number of reasons, gets channeled through communities of color, it has to do with policing practices, actually policing, you know, there was, there was a, a lot of policing practices that corralled drug markets into communities of color, um, and there's also a large police complicity in the, the drug trade, but that's a whole other conversation, people might remember the Knapp Commission. Um, uh, so there was, so the first political problem that Rockefeller faced is obviously, I'm, I'm not suggesting he doesn't have empathy for his constituents, so th there's that, but he's actually getting incredible pressure from within the African American community to deal with this problem, he's getting that from, for a long time. There is no like single African American community that speaks with one voice, there was a lot of different, there were a lot of different people who asked for different things, but there was a shared sort of sense that this was something that should be addressed. Um, so all of this, all of that happened within the context of, of course, this disease conception of addiction. So the state starts investing, because it, it not only invest, starts, the state, New York State is the leader in building out rehabilitative programs. Nationally followed, national, I mean, national news, they invest a massive amount of time and energy into this new cluster of various strategies to handle drug use. And so they fund therapeutic communities, which are sort of the forerunners of today's, what you might think of as today's um, like kind of treatment, you know, sort of drug treatment that you might go to, um, the privately funded, pri privately run. Um, they actually institute a massive civil commitment program where I could just call and say, my mom is a heroin addict. She's not. Um, the, the, um, my mom's a heroin addict, and, and, and she refuses to get treatment. And then she would have to. They they would, could come and institutionalize her. Um, 
there was, and, and those, and that was actually a really substantial, that was sort of the effort that Rockefeller put a lot of his um, emphasis on. This was also the beginning of methadone maintenance, which I think we're hearing a lot about now. This was the beginning of the establishment of a series of methadone maintenance clinics. Um, and the proponents of all these treatments, and this was quite expensive, and the city was investing, and the state was investing, and they were getting lots of attention. And what they were promising is that they were going to control crime and rehabilitate drug users. And they were going to do both. And, but this c controlling crime was really the top level pro political promise. And that's the promise that when Rockefeller ran for governor again after you know, each time, that's what your, your, the opponents would say. Oh, yeah, well, it looks like the crime rates are still going up. And you know, remember, this is a period where even if crime rates weren't changing, the, like, the reporting is getting better. So you're almost kind of gra like deter you're, you're going to get increases even if there aren't sort of changes in actual crime. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the relative effectiveness of these various programs, but the problem is they caused a lot of political problems for Rockefeller. And so what I'm trying to bring attention to is that these welfare state solutions, and again, going back to my question of welfare state versus cross they actually had, that there was features of these welfare state solutions caused themselves political problems, and they didn't, uh, and they set the ground for, for Rockefeller's eventual move. In a sense, he promised to be able to do something. Oh, I'm going to bring drug, drugs down. You know, I'm going to bring drug, tr drug use down. I'm going to bring crime down by you know, three years when you <laughs> run, run against me again. So there was a problem even in the promise in some sense. Um, but <laughs> there was, but it turns out that building a, net, a huge network of, of, of treatment programs is challenging, it's controversial, it's expensive, and these nobody, I probably will not surprise you, nobody wants methadone clinics on their block. So every time they tried to set up a program, there was massive resistance. Again, not surprising when you say it, but it was a real, like, it was a very serious political problem. Um, Methadone maintenance was actually the one that had the most political, like actually delivered the best sort of statistical results, but it was the, pro it was the, it was the thing that people, that they had the most political opposition to, because people viewed methadone, for instance, as drug maintenance. Um, they didn't consider people clean, you know, because it is, it's substituting, you know, you remain um, dependent up on, on opioids, it's just less disruptive, um, considerably less disruptive. Uh, but the, um, but, but so there was a ma so he had a massive political problem confronting. It turns out it's really expensive. Like the, this, the fact that he that, that someone would promise to sort of sweep all the addicts from the street, and then like three years later be like, wait, they're not all gone. I mean, they, you can't build. I mean, they, so they it, it was they couldn't find places, even buildings to house these programs, and the buildings that they did use were ex jails. <laughs> the, the, these these they were often repurposed prisons. So that brings me to my other problem. People who use drugs were not super keen on getting on this program all the time. They were a lot of the, I mean, it's unquestionably incredibly hard to get off drugs. Many people don't want to, but more than, I mean, but a lot of people would enter these treatment programs, especially the, these therapeutic, the, the, these civil commitment programs. And they were like, this feels a lot like jail. Like, I mean, in, in the sense that it's actually a jail, <laughs> it's actually a jail. Um, and, and they um, and there there was no trained really trained treatment staff, so they often rehired custodial folks. And there's all these I have all these quotes of people being like, "We're performing counseling with our bats," and they're like, I "Don't know that that's an effective drug treatment." Um, but and so people the people that were in these institutions often riot. I mean the conditions were so bad they riot. There was riots. There were revolts. They burnt a couple of them were the fire people set on fire. So and then once word got out on the streets, basically people who were arrested for drug use were like, forget treatment. I'm going to do my time in prison. Um, and so people were opting for prison over their, um, over the, what were often longer stays in drug, in drug treatment. So there was, so there's this huge things about like the way that these welfare programs were done were in, you know, had a series of complications and problems. Um, and they, um, and to make matters worse, in the mid-1960s, maybe some of you remember this too, there were suddenly new reports about heroin use in white and suburban areas. And Richard Pryor has this thing from his stand-up in 1980s where he says they call it an epidemic now, and that means white people are doing it. Um, so that, that's certainly the way that this, that a lot of, um, 
there's certainly something to that argument in the way that this history unfolded. There was, a, there was an incredible, um, there was also a scare about, about heroin use in Vietnam amongst the soldiers. I don't know if people remember that, but that was a massive um, country. So, so that just put, created a whole new force of political attention to this problem. So. Um, yeah, there's actually someone I, I, that in 1970, an official, like a, a state official actually said in front of Congress, he's like, as long as heroin is a problem isolated to the ghetto, it was a problem we could live with. Um, so, the, so I'm not just like, some of the, I try to flag when I'm sort of doing my historical analysis and when I'm actually telling you what they said. And in this case, this is actually, you know, what people were saying. Um, so, 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 so Rockefeller starts narrating this problem, and this is where I sort of get to what I kind of want to get across today, is that he starts narrating this problem, heroin, the whole problem, as a problem of drug pushers, and especially the expansion of low-level drug sellers, usually a pusher, you know, like th there was always really harsh penalties for people who were involved at the high level of the drug trade, who were really moving a lot of product around. But the pusher, when you talk about a pusher, you're talking about sort of a street level drug seller. Um, and this pusher creature became more and more significant in the political discourse of this time. And um, Rockefeller increasingly holds pushers, and it's not like he invented this, pushers are always problems, you know, or, or tend to be problems 50s earlier too, but um, sorry, I just thought of a historian in the audience. <laughs> I was like, um, the, uh, <laughs> got all these different voices, it's freaking me out. <laughs> like, um, the, the, um, uh, he held pushers, pushers responsible, and he assumed that they were the people, even you could even hear in the language pushers. There's an argument already in that, that, that the people aren't, I'm not a customer or a, you know, who wants a product. Someone is, you know, you probably remember, you know, someone is foisting this drug uh, you know, on, onto you. Um, and so in 1966, Rockefeller says, narcotic addicts are said to be responsible for one half of the crimes in New York City alone, and their evil contagion is spreading to the suburbs. So here, and this is a really typical like framing. This notion that um, this notion that drug that, that that drugs are sort of natural in a certain ecosystem, but when they escape, that, that, that it's like sort of this dangerous escape, and that when they escape from this sort of what, what's sort of understood as their as their correct ecosystem, that that this. That A, this is a problem, but B, that the cause of this, the vector of this disease, is the pushers, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of hippies that were saying something differently. They were saying, you know, we're doing heroin because we're trying to come down from amphetamines. And, you know, I mean, there was, like, there were different, there was lots of different alternative ar arguments going on. But, but, but this frame was very much around this idea that, um, that, that pushers, and, and Rockefeller increasingly said this, pushers were not only responsible for drug use and drug use spreading, but they're also responsible for crime. So like by the transitive property, I don't know if I have my ex-math teachers here, by the transitive property, pushers are responsible for like urban, they really become held responsible for urban disorder really sort of broadly. Um, so so the, the, another vector, and I'm gonna, another sort, not vector, um, another, uh, the last problem that I that I do well actually there's two more problems. One is that a group of lots of activists started using the state's commitment to funding treatment programs, and they started saying, "Okay, let's do this." Like I I want to. I want, and, but they'd say, you know, your treatment program isn't culturally sensitive. It's not, you know, it, it's like degrading in this way, or I don't like this treatment, or this, you're just keeping people doped up. Like, I want to, so people started taking this state commitment to rehabilitation and saying, I'm going to define what rehabilitation means. So there's these incredible stories about the young lords who were lined with the Black Panthers, and they took over a wing of <laughs> the New York, I, I'm laughing because it's just, you can imagine Rockefeller being like, are you kidding me? Um, but they take over a wing of a hospital, and they want to set up their own, drug treatment program and they're going to train everybody to become political activists, revolutionaries. And Rockefeller's like, this is not what I had in mind. This is not the rehabilitation that I, you know, I mean, this is not the vision of rehabilitation that I was particularly interested in forwarding. Um, okay, so the last problem is, I think probably the first problem people think I was going to say when I mentioned the Rock, you know, this is Nelson Rockefeller, the prototypical um, moderate Republican. This man, the biggest problem, not the biggest, one of his most serious problems is he wanted to be president so badly. Um, he, I think it's not radical to say, I think he felt like he should have just become president, <laughs> that it should have just, that it was sort of to his for the, um, it should have been his. And the problem there is that he was a very, he was the sort of quintessential moderate Republican in a party that was moving right. Um, and he was becoming, 
increasingly, you know, increasingly unviable, um, or that's certainly what people were saying. So, my, all, that's a long walk to get to the point where I'm gonna say to you that what the Rockefeller drug laws did is actually pr provide a solution to actually all of those, uh, all that whole cluster of problems. And it was in that context that he actually first publicly unveiled his plan. And I have all this sort of fun stuff in the book about the way that the plan came together and it just kind of, yeah, but just control myself. Um, the, uh, but he unveiled the plan in the State of the State speech, his State of the State speech, it was in January 1973, and he really shocked the political establishment and actually, frankly, a lot of his staff, including his drug treatment staff, who were like, what are we doing? Um, he shocked them by, by announcing in his, this very high profile speech, but usually wouldn't have gotten as much attention as it did this year, um, that the programs that he personally had championed for over a decade were abject failures. Total failures. And he says it's time for brutal honesty regarding drug addiction. In this state, we've allotted over a billion dollars to every form of education against drugs and treatment of the addicts through commitment, therapy, and rehabilitation. Let's be frank, let's tell it like it is. We have achieved little rehabilitation and we have found no cure. So in response, what he proposes is to make the penalty for the sale of drugs, regardless of quantity, any quantity, and this included trading, like not just gifting, so everyone in my front row ends up getting like, I'm acting, sorry. I'm like, I'm giving you drugs, and you know. She's got it, she's on heroin, I don't know, I'm sorry. Um, um, the, she, so, so even gifting, the punishment for those, regardless of quantity, is a lifetime in prison without any option of plea bargaining, parole, or probation. Nothing. That is the entire, that is the entire policy. Um, the New York legislature pub passes a, my, a diluted version of that, um, but the original proposal is for a complete and total banishment, essentially a strategy of quarantine, right? That we need to remove this sort of contaminating disease and we need to just extract it from society and there is no re-entry. It is a permanent severing. Um, and, and the proposal depended on the assumption that therapeutic programs had failed and that there was no other way. So Rockefeller says, these are drastic measures, but I am thoroughly convinced after trying everything else that nothing else will do. And so, and, and so the proponents of these laws are gonna claim that the law reflected the, the, the consensus that getting tough was the inevitable response to the given levels of drug use and street crime. And what I'm suggesting is we actually need to flip that script on him, um, which is that, that, that this, this narrative that it was incorrigible prisoners, I mean, I'm sorry, incorrigible drug users and foolhardy state treatments that made getting trust inevitable, I'm suggesting that the Rockefeller drug laws were actually implicated in producing this idea of a failed hopeless state and a failed hopeless set of po uh, population, right? That there, was no, that, there was, that there was no other way forward, that this was, we tried it all, it was a mess, there's nothing else we can do. Um, and what's remarkable about this is how much it erased. I mean, they, there had been a flurry of massive, massively harsh mandatory drug sentencing in the 1950s. This wasn't drug policy from like ancient Greece. Like we had just tried. Like when Rockefeller, you know, came to office, he was in in a, in a in a moment when people were like these these really, really, really harsh penalties, including death penalty for people who sell drugs to, the, to minors, which they never actually implemented, but I mean, which you could legally have done, like totally failed to to stop the massive in influx of drugs that, that happened. So it's like, it, it wasn't as if this hadn't just, like in very recent history, been tried. Um, and there are people that said this on the floor during these debates. Mr. Speaker, you say that, not, that we've tried everything and it's failed. Mr. Speaker, nothing could be further from the truth. It would be more accurate to say, and this is a man in the assembly, it would more be accurate to say that we have, that in the drug field, we have tried almost nothing. <laughs> I mean, people were saying, you know, these we just, we just started some of these programs. This is just, you know, this is just brand new. Um, and, and Rockefeller at times acknowledged that it wasn't simply the sort of impossibility of redeeming drug pushers that um, that made that, that had complicated the problems with his drug treatment. So it, you know, at you know one press conference, he admits that like we actually really can't afford to build out these really big treatment programs. And like, and he says at one point he's like, well, if the federal government would be willing to kick in. <laughs> Maybe I could do it, but like right now, the state just doesn't have the capacity to do it, you know. And so people had asked him, like, well, what about doing this, you know, putting more money towards this civil commitment? He's like, well, we can't really afford it. Um, and then, and, he, and then he also at one point kind of yells at the audience. He's like, you know, every community has rallied against uh, putting drug treatment programs in your communities. Every um, 
Everyone has fought to stop it, to prevent it. This has been our reaction to say, we don't want this problem, but we, we don't want this problem, but don't bring them into our community for treatment. So he's sort of, he's acknowledging that like a huge part of the problem was that he couldn't set these programs, he couldn't set these programs up. Um, and so what he offered to do with this law is to provide people with what he's saying that they wanted with this sort of very clear sort of permanent ba ba barriers between the sort of public and the, and, and the pusher which you know, we're not, maybe we can talk about later, is not even, is not a category that like explicitly exists. I mean, this is a sort of a political construct. Some, they were always like, is he an addict pusher or a pusher addict? Or just an addict? People would be like, oh, this guy's an addict. And they're like, okay, let him go. And then they'd be like, but, wait, but this guy's an addict pusher pusher. And they're like, oh. And so because like you couldn't find, you can't really find, like it, it, it doesn't, these categories don't neatly exist, it, you know. Um, so, um, so to wrap up, these, tr these laws did not work programmatically, and I guess I just maybe should have said that. I sort of just assumed that this didn't work programmatically, but Rockefeller, no one, he didn't even consult his drug treatment expert when he started. There was no, he wasn't like, what's the science, guys? Let's get to the bottom of this. This wasn't, that's not what's happening. They, they didn't work programmatically, but they really did do political work, and they helped resolve political problems for Rockefeller individually. Um, uh, Rockefeller per, as a per, political person individually, but also more broadly. So all over the country, Rockefeller, you know, people explained that Rockefeller's viability as a Republican candidate rested on his success at passing the quote, tough, toughest drug laws in the nation. So that was sort of, people were like, oh, he's in the game. And then there's this great period in 76 where like Reagan's trying to out, out Rockefeller, Rockefeller. Rockefeller's trying to out Reagan, Reagan, you know, like welfare, he's trying to get tougher on welfare and Rock Reagan's trying to get tougher on drugs. Anyway, so they have this little um, thing going on, but it does work to sort of keep him in the game politically. T to some degree, he's, uh, you know, he is nominated as vice president, um, but, it, but he, he's, you know, still kind of continued to be viewed as a moderate and doesn't end up being president, obviously. Um, but but, the, but it, there's other, the, the sort of bigger problems is kind of why I want to, is what I'm talking about, the bigger problems that it resolves. So, as new groups were using the state's therapeutic commitment, co commitment to demand programs, to sort of have a voice in what rehabilitation or what these programs, what rehabilitation would mean to them or their community, the Rockefeller drug laws repudiated an obligation to the well-being of low-level drug sellers. It was explicitly saying, and, and he explicitly said, I'm, again, this is me not, I'm not becoming extravagantly interpretive here. He says, I have been worried about this population for too long. They are not my, they are not the problem. You know, like I'm not the state's problem. So there was this sense that the state had to control this population and contain this population, but was not responsible and explicitly not responsible for reintegrating this population into society. Um, by taking resolute action against an issue that was a real issue of concern for African American Latino communities, Rockefeller claimed to be accountable to those communities. By targeting the pusher, who they charged with the source of this widening drug use, these laws expressed anxiety, they revealed and expressed the anxiety about white heroin use, and they really also still opened the possibility of reintegration and rehabilitation for drug users that weren't caught selling, right? And so, um, so this is really p some of the ongoing ways that this social response to drug use this bifurcation of our of our country's response to drug use happens, right? Where some some drug users um, get a certain set of reactions, and other drug users get another set of responses. Um, and this is something I mentioned earlier. Um, and it, it and it's important to note, sort of go back to my question about the welfare state, that this is not a this is not um, that, that the response to, note, to narratives of state impotence or the impossibility of the state to do anything was not the withdrawal or the retention of the state, um, but the replacement of an emphasis with, of rehabilitation with, a, with strategies of punishment and, and incapacitation. So in other words, the Rockefeller drug laws were a part of an ongoing negotiation over who the state was responsible to, not an abdication of state responsibility to manage social problems, and the laws re-narrated limits of political will. So, and these really were, you know, again, we all have to decide what what are the political commitments, and the, the state has to decide what the what the going to focus on. But there was a profound reluctance to reintegrate poor drug users, to significantly fund a diverse range of drug treatment programs, to tackle the profound economic transformations that were underway in the 1970s that were unquestionably part of concentrate of of the economic. Um, the, prof the profoundly difficult economic situations that had exacerbated the drug trade and the harm of the drug trade. 
Um, so there was a the, so so what these laws did is they tra translated what was in many ways a, a lack of political will into a problem of irredeemable drug sellers. So it sort of transformed. Um, it's it's in a process of story. It's basically a storytelling process to a large degree, and it's set and it's establishing sort of who and what is responsible for a set of things that people are facing. Um, and and historians are not usually big on offering advice or predictions about the future um, because they're always wrong. <laughs> um, that's not maybe not true. I think that probably at some point we get it right, but um, but. But I do think that this history suggests, and I want to wrap off here, that it's going that for people when we when we talk about ending mass incarceration, I think it's going to be really important to shrink. It's going to be really difficult. I have written really tough, but you know, with all my toughness, I should change it. Um, really tough to address the sort of our bloated penal system without actually confronting social inequality, um, stark economic and racial inequality, social insecurity. Um, because in many ways, it was many of these issues that the penal system was recruited to manage in the first place So, um, in, during this period. Uh, thank you guys very much. And um, I'm going to wrap up there, and then let's if, if, talk about things. <laughs> <laughs> Um, does anyone have any qu questions, comments, memories of me in middle school? <laughs> <laughs> please not the please not the third. <laughs> what was your story? Huh? What was the story? The that was the story. The Rockefeller drug laws. Um, I guess that's what I meant by the Rockefeller drug laws as being a story that illustrated this sort of opening thing about the state it changed its governing strategies in debates responding to social change, social movements and economic change. So the Rockefeller drug laws is a story where that is happening. That's what I meant. Yes, Mr. <laughs> Why? Well, I guess the only answer is yes. <laughs> to say a few words, if I may. Oh, okay. <laughs> Bye. Hi, my name is Michael Horn with Urban Milwaukee. And when I was a young kid, I liked to follow politics and still did, do. And in 1968, Nelson Rockefeller came to town for the uh, presidential primary. And I got his autograph. And I thought, I've been keeping it all these years. And uh, there it is. <laughs> oh, my god. Whoa! This is so exciting! It's like too late to put it in the book. <laughs> is that supposed to say Rocky? Yeah, ro Rocky. He's, hor he's a very serious dyslexic, I believe. Well, um, Nixon had given me his autograph. I was 14 years old at the Pfister Hotel, and I wanted his autograph. Give me your autograph. I had this thing in my hand and a pen, and he ignored me. I said, Nixon gave me his autograph. <laughs> <laughs> Rocky. We've got a Rocky now. This is like, oh, I'm doing a bad thing. Sorry, I always do this. I mean, I'm never good at staying behind my, this is like Christmas, except for better. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're like such a historian nerd where you're like, this is amazing. It's a piece of <laughs> um, Yes, Mr. Noth. <laughs> Talk about, you know, kind of a, uh, the perspective that when we think of crack, we think of crime, and when we think of the current situation or opioids, we think of disease. And you said it's not that simple, and it's really more about it's really more about populations. Like who gets treated? Who gets? Uh, which user gets labeled what? I'd love to hear a little bit more about. That. Um. So. It's something I follow, but not like super, super care. I mean, I, so I don't want to present myself as a sort of specialist on the public health kind of debates going on around um, heroin and and uh, prescription opioids. But what? But the way that I see this playing out today is that we have um, is that everyone is saying, and I think it's very true that that there is an opioid epidemic, and everyone is treating it as a white problem and, and there's and therefore as opposed to crack there's no you know the pun, the, the punishment apparatus isn't gearing up um, to a, 
absolutely there is no question this is the medical this has been medicalized the way that people are talking you know are talking about it. I think that is very true um, I think there's you can always tell this happened a little bit with meth too there's always this thing where people kind of move a little bit upstream you can see how far upstream is sort of you can kind of do some analysis based on that. So with math, people were like, well, what if we regulated pharmacies? You know, so with opioids, there's like, maybe it's prescribers and maybe it's doctors. You know, there's sort of these different, um, these willingnesses to kind of look beyond a sort of pathological drug user. You know, that's the whole story. We've got super predators and that's what's going, that's how we explain this. The, the reason I pause is that what's happening with opioids, I think is slightly more complicated, which is the machinery really hasn't slowed down, I think, quite as much as the penal machinery hasn't slowed down as much as people think or assume based on the, re the treatment rhetoric. And you particularly see this, and this again, this is where you see the echoes of this pusher idea. People are charging people who give drugs to someone who overdoses with murder. Um, which is really a sort of similar logic to this, you know, to the pusher logic, which is like, if we, you know, like, the, 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 there's, so, so there is still a punitive response to some, you know, to, to, to some people um, and to some, you know, and, and to some populations. And I don't necessarily think that people are getting pulled out of the criminal justice system as much as people think. And I'm also not convinced that folks that are not, I, I think that there's still a lot of people of color that are getting picked up for heroin that are not being treated like they're a part of an, um, a public health emergency. And I think that's also happening in white populations too. So I think my hesitation with that is more just that I think we shouldn't become overly even in, I think we should make the criticism, but I also don't think we should be overly confident that there isn't a pretty intense penal reaction happening um, on the ground. And I think some of these laws are really worth watching, and I think there's been, there's talk about accelerating them, of um, sort of, you know, I mean, like charging someone for murder is this, you know, that's a serious, uh, it's a serious charge, you know, and, and for sh for sharing drugs. I'm not saying anyone should go out and share drugs, but I'm just saying that's, um, and I'm not sure there's really any evidence to suggest that that's going to stop. You know, I mean, people always say there's some deterrent effect, but it's people who are using drugs don't think the person they're using drugs with is going to die. You know, like that is, tends to be, um, you, you don't, you're not, it's not like when you shoot somebody and you think, oh God, I should be held responsible. You know, like this is not, people are not, in, you know, people are not assuming that the person is going to overdose. So I'm not sure how effective of an actual count break that is. Um, but I think it's a really important question. Um, and this issue of how society, the, the stories we're telling ourselves about the causes of the opioid crisis, um, I think is a really important um, thing to be paying attention to. Oh, yes. You have <coughs> talked about the uh, kind of institutional pressure or leverage that the corrections industry, the correction industrial complex, <coughs> the role of police departments, and whether they favor or not favor. Maybe it wasn't a big part of the Washington story, although as Wisconsin approached mass incarceration, as I remember it, that was a big part. Now, what do you mean, the policing, the, pr the pressure from police for this stuff, or the? Well, the, sometimes the police just like to get people off the streets, right? Open windows kind of stuff. Kind yeah. Of it's, Tommy Thompson used to sell this stuff by saying, I'll give you a prison bus, I'll give you, I mean, he would run around and say it was part of the plans and construction. No, the story of, pol the, the New York history, it actually was one of the hardest parts was trying to, for me, of writing this, <laughs> and, and of trying to get the New York City policing history, which I've shorn out of here, lined up with the with the state politics history because it was actually really a tangled, fascinating story. And I'm going to kind of hold myself back because I could get a little uh, little overexcited and nerdy here. So I'm trying to think of the um, the first thing that I will say about the prison industrial complex. To the extent that that is ever a factor, it is later. So I, I know those are sort of two separate things. Private prisons. I mean, there is not a sort of private. Um, I agree with those people that say that the sort of prison industrial complex is really a second order explanation when we're trying to understand why mass incarceration happened. I think that prison industrial complex, you know, Ruthie Gilmore, is a, she, she calls them vultures. You know, I mean, that, that in a sense, they sort of feed off of the system as it gets going. But they're certainly, um, in the early stages, I'm talking 70s, you know, early, late 70s, early 80s, um, it's, really, it, it's really not privatization that's driving this. And I'm not, I know that wasn't exactly your question, but I would, I'd say that first. The policing story is way more complicated. The shorter answer is the chief of police, I think it's the chief of police, 
New York City flies to flies to um, Albany and says, dear God, don't pass this law. <laughs> it's going to be a disaster. Judges were like, I can't do this. I'm not going to ever get a jury to indict, I mean, to, to convict anybody. If every person that... <laughs> Every person that you send, to, you know, send to prison is never going to get out, or is going to get out, and you know, I mean, like, that we, we're not. This is going to back up our courts. Everyone's going to demand a trial, and we all know the penal system does not work if people take trials. That is a no-no. So, I mean, there was just so they were so. So, in some ways, the, the, there was actually from from a lot of different places that you would expect, sort of in a later political moment, there would have been support for this. There wasn't. There was actually a really interesting policing story, and I'll sort of try to do it really quickly. From, this is the Knapp Commission era. So the police had been, so one of the reasons that the that heroin markets got so intense during some of these periods is because police, it became revealed the police were implicated at every level of the drug trade. Um, and when this came out, you know, um, when, when this comes out in the New York Times through like this sort of expose, which I'm sure, you know, again, the Knapp Commission, when this comes out, the response you know, not totally, kind of understandably, is that folks, is that, the, is that the, they're just like, I don't want any single beat reporter even touching a narcotic state. You know, like if you see a narcotic state, I don't care if they're waving it in your face, you do not do it. It's, you know, so they basically prohibited police from, inter, for, for, from, this is for short periods, right? This isn't the whole thing, but there, but the point is, one of the reasons the situations had gotten so controlled is like one of the sort of tools that the state would usually have used to manage this had been really, pulled away, right? And so folks were getting mad because they're like, ah, there's a beat cop. And there was always complaints that beat cops weren't responding to drug markets in certain spaces, but they were, you know, that they weren't kind of do doing things. But in this situation, it was just like very immediate. The cops were just like, and so that was all sort of part, I mean, I didn't go into it, but that was sort of one of the parts of the political political challenges and the sort of limits of the t existing tools that were there at this moment. Um, and policing, again, becomes a huge part of this. Now, ultimately, the Rockefeller drug laws become an a very powerful tool for police, you know, and so, um, so they're able to say, I'm going to charge you, you know, so like, let's say I pick you up for a federal charge. Oh, I'm going to, you know, I've got a part in the book where the where a lawyer says, these things are out of control. The difference between this courthouse and this courthouse, the one that does the Rockefeller drug laws, is the difference between like probation and ten, 15 years in prison. <laughs> you know, and so the police, so police and prosecutors could, could sort of say, I'm gonna charge you in this court. You know, so it, be it became a very powerful tool, but early on the police, um, there was actually like, th there, it wasn't as if the police were demanding this, this policy. So. <laughs> um, yes? I know you historians don't predict the future, but I was um, taken by one thing from many things that you said, but you talked about Rockefeller saying, you know, New York doesn't have the money to do the treatment options. And that's what you hear the state saying right now, oh, really? is we don't have tight budgets, we don't have money to do this, and so we have a president who will say, you know, we're going to call a public emergency, but there's no money at the federal level. I mean, what, what do you see, or do you have a sense of what might have looked it over in the past, or what might make a difference now? Because I mean, I it's funny. I was the historian that wanted to like talk about movie, write about movies, and write about you know like crazy stuff that they said on the campaign trail, and I didn't want to get into the way that federal budgets and state budgets and city budgets interacted, and like who paid for like. If you know who pays for jail, who pays for you know who pays for prison, who pays for the, you know like who pays for the social welfare program, who pays for the you know like and and it turns out that those are actually really important things. And so part of the cha and again, uh, I don't I, I didn't like researching it. I got very confused, and I'm sure I, people don't want to be totally subjected to all the ins and outs of it in this period. But I think what you're pointing to is is one really critical piece, which is. You see this in the criminal justice system. You have a re weird incentive. In some ways, you know, like counties have an incentive when they're prosecuting someone to send them to prison, <laughs> because the prison and, and the pri and the prison is paid for by the state. <laughs> you know, they're like that's the state budget. Like I don't have to. You know, like it's not. A, I'm I'm a county prosecutor, but like I'm not. It's not going to come home to roost for me if the state budgets are broke. I mean, so there's these crazy different levels that incent that that these that federalism creates 
challenges, you know, for these things. What is interesting is this is why historically, and again, I don't want to get way into sort of like the weeds of welfare policy and whatever, but it's like, this is historically why you see so many fights over whether we have social programs paid for at the federal level or in state block grants. Because once we go into a state block grant program, you see this with welfare, you see this with, you know, with Medicaid, there's, there becomes an incentive for states to Cut, cut, you know, to, 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 to not, they don't want to offer this service and they don't want to offer it so robustly, you know. So when Social Security was passed during the New Deal, the folks that were the hardcore proponent of that, they're like, you know, they're like, we want this to be a federal program. You know, we want this to be a federally secured program so we can't have, you know, and, and so, and so this is where you see these debates over where these, what kind of social, what, what is the nature of a social right? You know, so if you talk about drug treatment, if drug treatment on demand, you know, was a really, robust social right that wasn't contingent, for instance, upon getting arrested, you know, that you don't, um, there's a fair amount of drug treatment on demand in, in, in some areas, but, um, but, but these are, I think this speaks to sort of the nature of our safety, of our social safety net. D does, does that make sense? Like there's a lot of these services um, are really sort of at the, you know, the city can pick up some, but, but I, for me, what I always end up, where the, the, the programs that, that I've seen historically that seem to be the most robust and the most difficult to um, mess with, not that people don't, you know, try, obviously, but that, have, you know, is, um, is Social Security, is med, you know, are, are, these, um, are these programs that are, you know, uh, I'm not saying that obviously there's not challenges with Social Security, but, um, but when they're sort of fe federally um, standard. You know, and uh, um, and I think that, and I really do think one of the takeaways for me of this research is that, again, sort of, that we're gonna ha that the penal system, um, that without that, that we really have to talk about our social welfare, you know, our sort of understandings of what rights we have as you know as citizens and as residents, to to sort of social well-being um, that we all have, and, and, and are those conditional rights, you know, are those rights that are conditioned upon certain behavior or having a job or having a kind of job that does this or that you know I, and I'm, I'm i'm not saying i have the answer but i do feel that um that that we have a uh, um or one of the things that sort of came to me as i as i as i wrote this book was that um was that there was that that there were a lot of places where where, where there was a really a lot of debate over like who should have who should get who deserved to get drug treatment and what kind of drug treat you know what kind of drug treatment who deserve to get health care you know health care and um, these various things and obviously you can't really understand I mean, like especially with the opioid epidemic but there's you know deep intersections between health care you know between access to health care and drug ab abuse you know like you almost um, you know, I mean, not just the sort of classic story of the person with the, you know, the person that couldn't get the rotator cuff repaired, you know, had to rely on pain medication and then became addicted, but even to the point of, you know, drug use becomes more and more problematic the more your, your, your mental health, you have mental health issues. If you have, don't have health insurance, you, you know, have a really hard time getting those mental health issues, you know, covered and so blah, 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 blah. So um, I'm, I'm holding back on the intricacies of the, of the federalism because it gets very uh, tangled, but it's really an important question. Oh no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No. At the, at the beginning, you, you uh, began to uh, refer uh, tangentially to some of what you viewed as the racial and uh, uh, economic causes or underlying this opioid thing. And I think you hinted at, uh, urb at the urban nature of it. Uh, and yet, a couple of years ago, the governor of Vermont gave his entire state. Oh, I wouldn't say opioids are, 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 are urban, but sorry, go on. Is that, did I missay that? Oh, sorry. Uh, that the State of the Union address was only about one topic. Over really? Here. Yeah. And here you have a rural, 97% white population. Is there anything that's, that's new about this that uh, you didn't? Uh... New about the um, about the. the um, I mean, that's what's amazing about drug epidemics is they're always new <laughs> you know there's always I mean, th I mean there really are there's really distinct features of the opioid opio I mean sorry the opium you know use of Chinese versus the scare about you know African Americans using cocaine in the you know in the reconstruction era they're new but they some of the same tropes recycle so that's sort of what I tend to to to, to 
kind of find interesting. Um, I think what's rem I mean, the the, the opioid thing, um, math was sort of, was, had some parallels, right? It was not all. It was not really purely understood as a um, as an urban problem. Is that everyone else's? I mean, that's sort of my. Now I'm just sort of being an American that was alive, like not a. Um, the uh, so I think that you that you. Um, I think that um, that this current crisis is is very bad, <laughs> and uh, you know it's very 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 bad. So I also that's why the other reason I try not to you know I mean that it um, more people are dying from opioid overdoses than car than car accidents and, and, and shootings combined. Is that right? Yeah, I'm like, am I sharing? I mean, that's that's a profound that's a profound um, thing. So, I, so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. So, yes, I think it's new. Yes, I think it's 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 also rural. I think it is also. I think it's being um, I think it's being constructed as 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 rural, and, and that is sort of part of it, the way that we're producing its notoriety, some of its notoriety, um, and why we need a different. You know, and I think that um, I think there is a lot of urbanness to it that is not be that 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 is not being given as much attention. I mean, I think there is an opioid. There's a heroin problem and an opioid problem in. Um, in urban areas too, and it's not—it's not the main way that it's being narrated. Um, okay, how about we do this thing? Uh, how about we do this thing where we get two, and then I go—I try to go really fast. Yeah. Two right in a row. Two right in a row. And uh, as you can tell, I'm very good at going very fast. I like your shirt, James. <laughs> <laughs> of a the state representative, Leon Young. Okay. In your research and your information gathering, to what depth did you go as relates to the impact on those individuals who were incarcerated, especially the so-called kingpin, you know, uh, under that law where they really got uh, a substantial amount of time given to them, versus, as you said throughout your presentation, a lesser time someone else, etc. So did you actually have opportunity to talk to people who have been or are incarcerated? Mm -hmm. And then I like to uh, close by saying there's a wonderful gentleman who I like for you to meet. Okay. And we want to give you a book. He's an author and I think it would be great. <clears throat> a great I would mirror. love that. Yeah, great mirror for where you're at and where he's at as well. Can okay. that happen? Let's talk. Yes, I, I, you've you've got the phone number on your shirt for me. <laughs> um, um, I'm not going to. I'm I'm, I'm going to respond to that. I'm, but I'm getting excited, so I'm trying to keep my keep myself back. And there's, there was one other person over here that. What? I think that was your point, right? That, yeah, that's his point. Yeah. No, I think I think that's the point. Um, go ahead. Around the world, are there other countries that have done a better job at this? Well, um, I pretty much I, I <laughs> I'm always hesitant to make like decisive comments. I would say all, mo most most countries. <laughs> 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 um, you know, depend again. I, this is subjective. What I could, you know, like there have been inc really Portugal has done pretty extreme decriminalization of of, of uh, very sort of pr pronounced decriminalization of, um, of of what you know what we call hard drugs. And again, these are debates, you know. And there's a lot, but you know, but I think countries that emphasize um, harm reduction have shown to not have the same acceleration in their, you know. So like so. There's always this question, like, does the whole world just like go go crazy and get high a lot all together at the same time? Because there's something to be said, you know. There's supply flows, like you see these sort of things happen, sort of transnationally, um, and and there's so so people would say that yes, in many countries, this to the extent that there's a trend happening, it's not happening as dramatically. You know, there's a lot of people who say that, you know, particularly around remember like. Sometimes when we when we talk about drugs, we should talk about like drugs that harm. So the, the ways that drugs harm. So in that sense, I think that it's unequivocal to say that many countries have ways that mitigate the harm. So for instance, you know, really developed needle exchange programs um, certainly have done better jobs at, at, at keep at getting um, AIDS transmissions, you know, transmissions of various diseases um, under control. So yeah, so I would look at Portugal. I mean, I, you know, Europe. I mean, it's it's it's. 
actually pretty much it's pretty much across the board. Um, to, to your point, I spent a lot of time in the book trying to find um, the people's responses that were convicted for drug crimes, their response, the way that they actually, um, the way that they said, and, and they, they're very, they were totally locked out of this debate in really interesting and disturbing ways that you could ask, because you would think, why don't we ask these people about how to stop drug use? Um, and, but you have a lot of people saying things. Um, I, I didn't do systematic um, interviews ab about for any of the book, for reasons that I could, oral histories, for reasons that I can talk about, but um, but I've talked to lots of folks, you know, sort of independently, but there's, but I do have a lot of people in the book talking about what these laws meant, um, and to, to them, or the way that they interpreted them, and then the way that they argued against these laws to the to the governor when they were trying to get the governor to not, to, 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 to soften the laws. Um, and then the, the, the last thing that I will say is that one of the things, that, that the problems that happened with, with this law was that actually the sentences for the like sort of small time dealers and the sent, it actually like approached the sentences for these like really high level dealers. And that became a, pro that became a problem because it was like everybody, first of all, everyone who was like, I mean, so because so, you the way that the law worked, it doesn't really. I won't go into it, but you you're not you weren't allowed to plead into a lower level of of like. So if you were at like so if you couldn't, you, you basically all of these small time dealers were sort of put into a very high level of the sort of top level of sentencing of of, of punishment. So really, what happened during this period is that you had sort of kingpins, kind of getting to know really well, <laughs> in prison. People who were, you know, really low, you know, often more low-level, um, uh, low-level offenders. Um, I hate that term, low-level uh, people who've been convicted for lower-level uh, crimes. You all, this has been a total honor, um, and I'm super grateful. And thank you for your questions. I'd love to keep on talking if people are interested. Um, love to meet <laughs> your friend and get his book. And uh, and again, thank you all again for coming. All right, we have the books for sale up at the front desk. If you are interested, the signing line will be back here. Thank you all for coming. We would not have a bookstore without you. Please have a good evening. Oh, that'd be awesome. An MCM production.